The Quality Institute is a nonprofit organization with more than 100 members from every corner of healthcare in New Jersey, with a mission to improve the safety, quality, and affordability of healthcare for everyone. The Conversation of Your Life is a program of the Quality Institute that we want to talk about today. Hello and welcome to Aging Insights. Today, I want to welcome Katie Basaha from the Conversation of Your Life at Quality Institute. As a community health associate, Katie advances the Quality Institute's statewide community health initiatives, including Conversation of Your Life and the Mayor's Wellness Campaign. Katie, welcome, and I'm glad you're here with us today. Yeah, thank you so much for the warm introduction, Kathy. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, a lot of my work uh, leading up to working in the Quality Institute has uh, run the gamut of public health, whether it's uh, substance use prevention, uh, adverse childhood experiences, nutrition. Um, and now in my new walk of life, I've got COIL or the Conversation of Your Life program. So I'm really excited to be here today and share with your viewers about our statewide community health initiative. So let's start with COIL. Uh, what is the program and what is it about? So COIL, or Conversation of Your Life, is an initiative of the Quality Institute's Mayor's Wellness Campaign, and that aims to provide communities throughout New Jersey with resources, educational programs, and connections to subject matter experts and speakers on how advanced care planning is an essential part of health and wellness, as well as aging. And so really, we aim to empower residents to discuss, document, and share their health care priorities with those who matter most. And um, in 2023, we underwent updating COIL by focusing on how it can support healthy aging and aging in place, which we know is a major focal point uh, across the country, but especially yeah. in New Jersey. So we know that we're all going to age and aging is a fact of life and planning for aging gives us the power in our decisions and guides those who matter most to carry them out for us. And let's talk a little bit about um, advanced care planning, because I think it's I think it sounds scary for a lot of people, but it doesn't have to be. It's not about fear. It's about preparation. So can you give us a little more detail on that? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great place to start, Kathy. And thanks for calling out that fear part, because I think a lot of people feel feel that. But I find that that's also they're not too sure what that process looks like. So advanced care planning is a process of making decisions about future health care preferences in case a person becomes unable to make their own decisions. So this lets us discuss our values, our goals and treatment options with those who matter most our healthcare proxy, and our healthcare team. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, I just wanted to highlight the study that the in 2019 that the Massachusetts Coalition for Serious Illness conducted. This study found that 80% of people are actually aware of what advanced care planning is, which okay. I, I thought was the opposite. But right. two out of three actually have a reason for why they didn't want it or they didn't need it. And those common reasons where they weren't sure if their healthcare team would follow through with those wishes. But mm -hmm. I also think the most impactful one is that they think that their doctors and decision makers are going to magically know what they want. Um, oh. This impacts how COIL would focus on empowering people to make those decisions and then actually have those conversations. Mm -hmm. So there is no magical thinking. Right, right. And that's important to point out. I think that, um, you know, we don't have as we get older, people tend to have more doctors and not every doctor would know what you want or know you as well as your primary care physician or your geriatrician. It's just, you can't count on that relationship and the person, one, knowing what you want, but also being there when a decision needs to be made. Yeah, absolutely. So having those documents in place will let us um, actually be able to communicate those wishes. So if we have them, we can give each of our doctors as we grow older um, a copy of those wishes so that they have a good guideline for us. So let's get into the details of advanced care planning and what these documents are and what they do for us. This is a really great place to start, Kathy. So advanced care planning is a process of making decisions about future health care preferences in case a person becomes unable to make their own decisions. So this lets us discuss those values, goals, and treatment options with those who matter most, our health care proxy, and our health care team. And furthermore, I just wanted to like highlight that study, the 2019 Massachusetts Coalition for Serious Illness study. And that study found that 80% of people are aware of advanced care planning, but two out of three of them have a reason for why they didn't want it or they didn't need it. 
So okay. the most common reasons were that they weren't sure if their healthcare team would follow through with those wishes and that their doctors and decision makers would magically know what they want, right? So a lot of people think that like, oh, don't worry about it. My husband will know or my 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 daughter, or whatever the case may be, or my best friend. And so this impacted how COIL would focus on empowering people to make those decisions and then have those discussions. You said um, you mentioned, you know, your somebody might know what you want. Um, I want to address what something that's really important is people are emotional and they get upset. So they might not be remembering it or thinking clearly. And isn't that one of the reasons that we want to do this in advance? So, you know, what you might talk about in advance in a nice calm situation is very different than what you might be feeling emotionally in the heat of the moment when you're not feeling well, when your loved one isn't feeling well or experienced a crisis. But isn't that one of the reasons to really emphasize planning this in advance? Yeah, absolutely. And that's really the ma- one of the major benefits of planning in advance. So when we have those conversations and they feel scary, um, when we have those documents in place and we've had those conversations in non-crisis uh, times, then we will be able to kind of refer back to those. So that's one of the major benefits of speaking to your physician and those who matter most about your wishes for care. So whether or not you have a serious illness or in a medical emergency where you can't speak for yourself, it gives you a voice uh, in your care. So the mm-hmm. way I see it is like you're now you're you're not the driver, you're a passenger, but you've given your decision maker and your healthcare team a really great personal roadmap. And that's an advanced care planning document. They really mm-hmm. like give a roadmap for them to kind of drive the way you want to and get you to the destination and make all those stops that are important to you. Um might also shock people that, but without communicating your wishes, people won't magically know what you want, right? Like we kind of highlighted that earlier. And if Mm -hmm. I may give a personal example, uh, when I was filling out my own advanced directive, which most people might seem as a little odd because I'm a little on the younger side, but working with COIL has really encouraged me. Um, I automatically assumed it'd be my sister uh, who would be my healthcare proxy. She's my rock. She's my confidant and everything. And so it just seemed like a natural fit for me. But when I did bring it up to her, she was just like, absolutely not. I would never. And we had a discussion about why she was the best option. And I respected that. Because if she didn't feel like she could be my voice Mm -hmm. uh, in an emergency like that, then she wasn't going to be my best uh, proxy. So then I spoke with a few close friends and I identified somebody that would feel, one, comfortable with the wishes that I have in place and then comfortable being my voice in a medical emergency. So if I hadn't talked to my sister, I could have potentially put her in a really uncomfortable position in the future. And so it's really imperative that we do have these conversations ahead of time so that Mm -hmm. when we are in a medical emergency or experiencing a serious illness, uh, the people that will talk for us will have our best interests in heart and be able to communicate it for us. Now, there are several documents um, involved with this. Can you explain what they are and how they empower people to have a say in their care? I would say it's one of our most common questions during like a COIL workshop, as there's so many documents and it can get uh, confusing. And so with that being Mm -hmm. said, I will just say there's a lot of ground to cover. So feel free to interrupt me. Uh, So let's start with what an advanced directive is. Uh, These are those legal documents that outline an individual's healthcare wishes and preferences, including choices about medical treatments, life-sustaining interventions, and organ donation. These directives guide healthcare decisions if the individual is unable to communicate their wishes. And I really want to emphasize the if there in that statement, because a common myth about advanced directives is once you name someone to make those decisions for you and sign on Mm -hmm. that dotted line, you're giving up your rights to make your decisions. And that's just not true when it comes to your advanced directive. Right, right. I just want to remind uh, your viewers that this is strictly for when you cannot speak for yourself. Good point. And now I'm going to kind of go into those uh, few options when it comes to an advanced directive. So each of them does overlap in some way, but has different functions. So the first one I'm going to start with is the proxy directive or the healthcare power of attorney. And this identifies a person who would make your healthcare decisions for you and only activates if you can't speak for yourself. 
right? And then that next document, which kind of goes hand in hand with that healthcare power of attorney is a living will. And mm-hmm. this states that your instructions for life sustaining medical care in the event that you're unable to speak for yourself. And so usually they, like I said, they kind of go hand in hand. So the document tends to use a lot of difficult to understand medical and legal language, which can be a barrier for some people. So the next advanced directive that I wanted to bring up is the five wishes. And so Mm -hmm. this document combines basically the living will, the healthcare power of attorney into one document. And then it also addresses personal, emotional, and spiritual needs. So it's Mm -hmm. presented in a really simple format in these five outlined wishes and written in everyday language to reduce confusion with like medical and legal jargon. And we often distribute these documents actually at our COIL workshops or panel presentations presentations due to their ease of use. So depending on your preferences, you might choose the five wishes or a combination of a living will and a healthcare power of attorney. Mm -hmm. But again, it all comes down to choice. Yeah, Uh, those documents do not require a licensed physician to fill it out. And so when they are completed, it is recommended to share them with the physician and your healthcare team and your proxy to assure the best execution of your wishes for care. Mm -hmm. And I think I want to point out when you said, you know, sharing it with your proxy, it's important for people to have these handy or at a place where someone can find them because we're, you know, we're talking about situations where there might've been an accident where you're not planning to go into the hospital, but something happened. So you're an accident, you're away from home. Um, I don't expect people to carry these around with them all the time, Mm -hmm. but to have it in a place maybe with your other important documents or where somebody in your family or a friend can find them if needed. Yeah, definitely. And that's a, we, we do hear from a lot of people like, oh yeah, I have a living will. It's alongside my, uh, my regular will in a locked box that only I know the code to, right? And they've never given a copy. I've also gotten some really great stories from some of our solo seniors that say, well, I don't really have a person, but instead I wear it like a dog tag or on like a flash drive, which I think is really interesting. Wow. A lot of creative ways that people are, especially those that are like, okay, I'm down to do this. I'm definitely going to have an events directive. Um, but in case they need it, they have a few different creative ways. So that person has it on them at all times. Wow. Um, but even with the five wishes at the end of the document, there's actually a card that you can put into your wallet or purse that says, I have an advanced directive. So in the mm-hmm. case of that emergency and they look in that wallet, then at least they have that information like, okay, this is, they have this and this is the the contact information for their right. proxy. So right. I think that that's really a great part of that five wishes document. Yeah. And we had, I hosted a five wishes um, kind of event a few years ago when I was first learning about COIL and it was a group of probably about 12 people. And I have to say, it was really a great discussion they had, um, kind of giving each other ideas. It, it was it was not scary at all. It was a very productive and bonding event. So I, I, I encourage people, if you're going to do it, do it with a friend or do it with a group of friends, your book club, <laughs> your senior yeah. center, because um, people were sharing some great ideas and also a lot of experience where they had witnessed it or been part of it with somebody else. And that was really, really helpful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's one of my favorite things about our COIL workshops is, um, yes, we have the presenter. Yes, we have the subject matter experts. But knowing that we also have a group of experts in the room um, yeah. that are actually listening to our presenters or <laughs> participating, uh, a lot of the times that storytelling part is what gets people to actually think about it, right? It's not yeah. us saying you should have one because of this, that, and the other thing. Right. Um, it's people saying like, this has been my experience and it's been really beneficial. Uh, so I, I love that you brought that up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also just wanted to, uh, pull in the next two documents and I swear that'll be my end of documents. Um, after this, uh, is just about the DNR and the pulse, because I think a lot of people know about these, but as far as how they work, uh, there's a little confusion and they're definitely a little bit different from our previous advanced directives. So the first thing I wanted to highlight is that only a licensed practitioner can write an order for these two, uh, specific advanced directives. So a DNR or do not resuscitate order uh, is this 
specific advanced directive that indicates that a person's desire to avoid CPR in the event of a cardiac or respiratory arrest. Mm -hmm. And then we have the POLST, which is the practitioner's order for life-sustaining treatment. And this form is designed for seriously, seriously ill people or those who are medically frail. So this form enables patients to indicate their preferences regarding life-sustaining treatment and provide instructions for healthcare personnel to follow. Mm -hmm. So this is different than the five wishes or a living will, as this is more akin to like a prescription or a medical order that has to be followed by mm -hmm. those medical personnel, as opposed to the five wishes and living will is like that guiding map for them. And so both the DNR and the Pulse complement an advanced directive as opposed to replacing it. So I still definitely encourage, even if you have a DNR and a Pulse, to have an advanced directive, like a living will or or, um, or a five wishes, because each of these documents give people autonomy in their care. They can outline yeah. what's important to them, who they want to make those decisions for them, what kind of treatments they'd like, you know, anything like that. And so... I'll also say when I first started looking at these documents, it was really daunting. Like I respect that it is, there is a lot to look at, but remember that you don't have to fill it out all in one go. So just because okay. you have five wishes doesn't mean you have to like lay out all five of them um, in an hour and that's all the opportunity you get. So you can okay. take some time to work through those. And finally, you can also change the document as you see fit. Maybe something happened in your lifetime that has changed. Maybe you got divorced. Maybe you had a grandchild. Maybe something's changed your mind um, mm -hmm. as far as those wishes are are concerned. But you are allowed to change it. Yeah. Right. That's really good to acknowledge. And you also used, I think, a key word, autonomy. Mm -hmm. This is where people can have autonomy and control. Yeah. Because you know, in a in a healthcare situation it is very easy to get swept up in kind of the, um, you know, in a whirlwind of activity where you don't have that time to think or yeah. discuss things can be happening very quickly by doing this in advance. And, you know, even if, like you said, you can update it, you can change it. Um, it gives you control and autonomy in your decisions. And I think that's something that's very important for people to, to have in mind if, when they, when they, go through and look at these documents. Um, so how can someone start a conversation of your life program or do an event in their community? What are the ways they can get going? So quail initiatives can really be started in someone's community or their community living room. We like to call them community living rooms. So like libraries, senior centers, really places that people um, feel comfortable gathering and sharing, just like your experience with a Five Witches event a little while ago. Um, so you can do that in several ways. So the first thing I encourage people to do is to access our newly updated Quill toolkit, which is on our website. And this toolkit provides all the information and resources you would need to get started. And it's broken down into four major sections. So the first section is an introduction to the toolkit and Quail mm -hmm. basics. So kind of like what we just broke down. Um, and then it's followed by healthy aging and coils so that we can help you to align coil with your healthy aging initiatives, right? And then there's the bulk of the toolkit, which is how to successfully launch COIL in your community. And that really gives a step-by-step -step guide as long as resources um, and tools that you can use to set up a program in your community. And then finally, there's raising awareness about COIL. And that has tools and resources like our community messaging toolkit and our media clubs to encourage these conversations. So it really just as whether it's a topic you're passionate about or you're a subject matter expert or a community leader who sees the value in bringing these conversations to your fellow residents, the toolkit can guide you in doing so. So yes. just some of those strategies from the toolkit uh, that, they, that somebody can use to bring to their community, they can honestly just reach out directly to me or a COIL partner to schedule a program. We can incorporate, they can incorporate questions about advanced care planning and their community needs assessment uh, just to see like, what do residents know? What, it, what yeah. does everybody want to know about advanced care planning? Um, and then they could also just utilize our community messaging kit to share about COIL via social media, blog posts, or a newsletter. So their okay. strategy is big and small, regardless of whether you're one person or a large organization that you can make an impact on our culture about talking mm -hmm. about advanced care planning, because that's what we really want to change with COIL, that culture part where we're kind of a little scared, a little right. 
uh, in our shells about discussing it with those who matter most. Right. So I, I'm wondering, so, you know, as more and more people hold these events and, and, and get the word out on this, what has, what has been the response to these conversations and these events? I know when I hosted some years ago, it was before COVID, um, people were, they were relieved. They were excited to attend. And something I heard over and over again, when, you know, we thought it was a scary conversation, they said, I am so glad we're doing this. It's my, it's my kids that don't want to talk about it. Mm-hmm. Where I found that older adults did want to talk about it. They just were struggling getting their family to listen to them. Yeah, that's a really great point. Um, And we actually have just like I said, in that toolkit, there are a number of resources. So there's like a letter to your loved ones uh, that one of our partners, uh, Maureen, has put together uh, through talking about uh, COIL and conversations like this, where she's seen that a lot of people are very like not necessarily the people we're presenting to, but as you said, maybe their kids or who their proxy or who their preferred proxy would be, Mm -hmm. right? Um, They don't want to talk about it. So she actually has like a cool little template that's like, here's a letter you can write to let them know like, hey, these are my wishes that I really want to talk about it with you. So I just wanted to kind of throw that out there. Um, But uh, yeah, as you said, like a lot of people feel kind of relieved to have these conversations. Uh, We've been able to like collect some survey data uh, from our, uh, from these community conversations. And really the response has been overwhelmingly positive. We learned that most participants found that the workshops were really useful and they also plan to complete an advanced directive or they already have one in place. As you said, Mm -hmm. a lot of them are here uh, on track. Uh, But we, what we truly wanted to impact is whether or not participants will take uh, those conversations to those who matter most. And the survey data does show that they were feeling more confident in actually initiating the conversation because they had tools that they could use, as well as planning to actually initiate the conversation with those people. Um, Good. The other thing I wanted to just say is that we also have had the opportunity to hear stories from people about how advanced care planning has impacted their care and wishes. So like you said earlier, um, a lot of what goes on at these events and workshops is hearing from one another. So Mm -hmm. I remember a woman that was in her early 50s. She shared with us that she actually had a heart attack in her mid 40s. She never expected that to happen. And that encouraged her to actually fill out those documents and discuss it with her proxy and her loved ones and her doctors. But she also advocates out to her loved ones and her family to say like, hey, you also need to have this documentation Mm -hmm. in place. And this is why it matters to me that you do. So she just kind of had waved off like advanced care planning because she's like, well, I'm kind of on the younger side, nothing's going to happen. And then this medical emergency had happened. So Mm -hmm. Uh, We always encourage participants to share their stories with us uh, during our workshops, because like I said earlier, that that makes a lot of impact when people are on the fence on whether or not Mm -hmm. they want to talk about it. And we were talking about community and family, but let's go back to talking about how do you bring this up with your doctors? Because when when you fill out a form at your doctor's office, I think they always ask, do you have a proxy? Do you have a DNR? They don't always ask for a copy of it. So how do you bring this up with the doctor in their office? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, The first thing I like to think about is that we have to keep in mind that our healthcare team is human too, right? Mm -hmm. They're not some pariah that's like, I can talk about everything. And so for some of them, they're just as scared as having those conversations with us. So hopefully if they can put it on a checkbox that you fill out, then they're like, ooh, I don't have to talk about it, right? (laughs) So I encourage viewers to really kind of bring it up with their healthcare team if they feel comfortable. Uh, And fortunately, the Conversation Project has amazing resources on how to bring it up with whether it's your healthcare team, the people that matter most to you, and their proxy. So I'd recommend that viewers that want to bring up that conversation, check out that that guidebook, because that'll be able to give you that empowered feeling of like, I'm here to have this conversation with my uh, doctor or healthcare team. So people can actually schedule a separate visit with their practitioner to discuss advanced care planning. And Medicare Part B covers a voluntary advanced care planning visit as part of your yearly wellness visit. So I definitely encourage people to take advantage of that, that the fact that it is laid out there um, in our medical plans, um, 
uh, or sorry, yeah. in our health insurance. And then I also recommend checking out the What Matters Most to Me workbook if you're not sure, like, what matters to you, right? Like, because sometimes when we just, like, ask, like, what do you want for medical care? It's like, I don't know. <laughs> it's hard. Right. Uh, so the Conversation Project has a number of great workbooks uh, that you can take a look at before going into that appointment so you feel empowered and know what matters most before speaking with your practitioner. Good. That's a great tool to have. So I have one other question for you, which just makes things a little more challenging. You know, a lot of people, they, they don't have family nearby. They may have moved away. Or their family may have moved away. So what about having this conversation long distance? You know, if your kids are in another state or you've moved away, like, yeah. how do you suggest having it if you can't have it face to face or in person? Mm hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of people, especially now in the technology age, right, where you are very like separated, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but even if someone isn't nearby, that person can make choices for you over the phone. Mm -hmm. I think what I would recommend, and you can see this, I think on, uh, I know specifically in the five wishes, you can see this, that you can recommend an alternative proxy. So this isn't a person that's like 50-50, because when that comes up, that makes actually it really challenging. This yeah. is a person that if your main proxy is unavailable, they can make the decisions for you. So because we're relying on technology or a phone, you might want just a second person in command if uh, if needed. So, mm -hmm. uh, But just remember, again, to talk to them about it and let them know you chose them, just like my sister, um, and then choose the person that works the best for you. And yeah. I also just wanted to keep in mind that each state has different laws on the post in which advanced care planning documents are recognized. But as far as advanced care planning or advanced directives go, the five wishes document is widely used and accepted. There's also ways to have a virtual advanced care planning document in place, uh, which can be helpful for people that are long distance. And that I, as always, I encourage you to share uh, either a virtual or hard copy with those individuals that may be mm -hmm. your proxy. And it's a great way to assure that your wishes for care are being honored. I want to emphasize that this is about maintaining control of what you want and maintaining your autonomy. Um, mm -hmm. It's not about giving that away. And it also is a gift that you can give your family or your loved ones so that they know and they understand what you would want um, they're not in a situation where they're making emotional last minute decisions that they can think about it. They know in advance and they can really approach a situation more, more informed. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and every time that I've talked to people about the conversation of your life or, or doing these documents, that's the word I hear over and over again. It's a gift. Yeah. Yeah, I often hear that from um, a lot of our COIL partners, and then also the people that have actually filled out these forms and shared it with those who matter most to them. Uh, so yeah, I think you summarized it really well. Um, and then I just wanted to just let everybody know uh, or end on saying that like the Quality Institute staff is really here to help you implement and utilize the COIL toolkit in your community. So just because the toolkit is there doesn't mean you can't contact us, doesn't mean you can't reach out for us for support. So we can provide technical assistance to integrate COIL into your community or into your mayor's wellness campaign, and then educate. We can even come out and do an educational session for those community leaders to actually learn about the importance of it or share this wonderful recording with them. Um, and then furthermore, we can connect them with COIL advocates that can really champion healthy aging and subject matter experts for community programming. So really, we're, we're just here to help. So feel free to reach out to us at any point. Yeah. Okay, great. And we have all of your information on our website at njaw.org. People can look at our resources page. So Katie, I want to thank you for joining us today. And I want to thank you for all the work that you and your team are doing. Um, this is really something that's so important and you make it very easy for us all to have these conversations. Thank you. That's a wonderful compliment. I'm happy to have my team that supports us in doing this work. So. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you to NJAW for having us on. 
Aging Insights is brought to you by our funders, supporters, and viewers like you. You can watch this and past episodes of Aging Insights on YouTube or through our website, njaaw.org, and you can listen to us where you find your favorite podcast app. For an extensive list of resources for older adults, visit our website, njaaw.org, on the Services and Resources tab.